Proverbs 11.30 The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Bible smack. Ugh. So, when the Bible talks about soul winning, it's really to be someone who is encouraging someone to change their hearts and minds and eventually accomplishing that. And uh, today we're going to uh, do a game changer on the doctrine of election. And we're going to go through the scripture and talk about what election is. The um, common understanding of election is that um, coming from the Reformed and sometimes Catholic perspective, that God, before the beginning of time, chooses who will and will not be saved. But uh, basically, I when I first read the Bible my first time through, and I saw terms like chosen and election, that God has chosen you. I thought of it in terms of like your calling. And so I thought this is like my destiny, my place in this world. God has chosen me for such a time as this. And so it just naturally flowed that way with my young understanding. And then when I got to Bible college, they said, you know, they gave this definition of choosing for salvation. And I thought, well, these are great scholars, so obviously that must be what the truth is. Now, I've written on this um, many years ago on my blog, and I will uh, link that in the description. But basically, um, after many years of dealing with these issues... Uh, when you look at Calvinism, um, the tulip, you have uh, different doctors, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance in the saints. You really look at these two core teachings, election and atonement. And the two, by nature of the way the system was set up, are in contradiction, contradiction of each other. So basically, um, I've seen different Calvinists teach this, and uh, one particularly was uh, John MacArthur, who said there's a tension between the Great Commission and God's election and predestination. And basically, they'll typically chalk it up to the mystery of God. But the real problem is, is that if you develop a system of theology and you develop an explanation and a doctrine, and that doctrine contradicts itself, then you developed it, therefore you should be responsible. Because if you know that the Bible is inspired of God and true, and the, therefore the Bible doesn't contradict itself, you should reconcile contradictions instead of make contradictions, and then take the name of the Lord in vain and put his word on yours. But um, that is basically what happens, is they say, you know, who are you to defy God's will? And so I'm doing like a series of videos, and I've dealt with the issue of reconciling predestination with free will. Now I want to talk about the doctrine of election. All right, um... Let me go ahead and I'll lay out my five points on the doctrine of election. Um, you have the terms uh, election and chosen. In uh, the New Testament, they're merged into one Greek word, electos, um, which is um, when you look at the election in the Old Testament, uh, the election and the chosen. You really see them as um, one doctrine, especially thanks to the New Testament. But um, these terms, traditionally understood by the Jews, is that they are the chosen people as a work of service. And this was kind of interesting, 
interesting to me when I, I looked at this. So what I did was I started doing some studies on it. And so election, I'm going to argue, point one, is that it is a choosing of the Lord, you know, or a Lord, a sovereign, of what um, is going to be of service to him. Then we'll look at uh, who is elect. Israel is elect. The third point is that um, the first half of the New Testament is in pure agreement with election as a, cho a choice of servants, a choice of service, and um, also that this is of Israel. Okay. By the way, I don't know why my tongue is kind of <laughs> messed up today, so um, it's easy for me to slur right now. My muscles are tight, and I'm not I'm not medically educated, so. I don't know. I'll take something. <laughs> but I apologize. All right. The fourth point is that then through this process, the Gentiles become called. And the church is chosen or elect. The fifth point. The church is chosen or elect to deliver the Great Commission. And so now let's go over the scriptures and deal with these points. Um, not quite as organized. I'll, get, I'll just be giving commentary as I um, deliver these scriptures. So the first reference chosen is Exodus chapter 14. All right, Exodus 14, verses 5 through 7. It says, And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled, and the heart of the Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took six hundred chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains of every one of them. And so the Pharaoh took 600 chosen chariots. Obviously, the Pharaoh was deciding on which chariots he would save from before the foundation of the earth, on which chariots he would have mercy. No, he chose the chariots for a purpose, to serve him. Okay. Well, then we go to Psalm 78. Psalm 78, verse 31. Let's see here. It says, The wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. So the wrath of God is coming upon his elect who he decided to save. Or maybe... The wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. Uh, for all this they sinned still and believed not for his wondrous works. Let me go up a little bit earlier. They were not estranged from their lust, but while their meat was yet in their mouths. So basically, um, 
you know, they're doing sin and God has these chosen men, not chosen to save, but they were chosen of Israel and they were, I uh, didn't get too deep in the passage. Let's see here. I'll go ahead and give a bigger passage. Uh, Therefore, the Lord heard this and was wroth, so a fire was kindled against Jacob and anger against came uh, up against Israel because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. So God didn't choose them for salvation. Okay. <laughs> they were not believers. All right. That was in verse 21. All right. Next, Psalm 105. Now we're going to see that Israel is the chosen, though, okay? They're not chosen to salvation. They're chosen for service. Um, I think this, the latter passage I'm going to read is really about them being chosen. But we want to affirm this foundation here. So uh, Psalm 105, verse 8. He hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac, and confirmed it the same unto Jacob for a law, and to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying unto thee, Will I give the land of Canaan the lot of your inheritance? Uh, and I'll go ahead and add verse 12. When they were but few in num men in number, yea, very few, and strangers in it. And then the uh, latter passage, verse 42. For he remembered his holy promise and Abraham his servant, and he brought forth his people with joy, and his chosen with gladness, and he gave them the lands of the heathen, and they inherited the labor of the people. And so Israel is the chosen people ethnically of God, not chosen to salvation necessarily, hopefully. But basically, they are chosen for a purpose. Okay, And so the understanding of who the elect are is Israel. Okay, uh, not chosen necessarily to salvation. Hopefully the two come together, and they will later. But chosen to be his people for a service through his covenant. Now, we go to Isaiah chapter 42. No. Chapter 41. I'll be doing 41, 42, and 43. Let's see here. All right. 41, Isaiah 41, verses 2 through 7. Who raised up the righteous man from the east and called him to his foot, gave the nations before him and made him rule over kings. He gave them as the dust to his sword and his driven stubble to his bow. He pursued them and passed safely, even by the way that he had not gone with his feet. Who hath wrought and done it? Calling the generations from the beginning. I, the Lord, the first and the last, I am he. The isles saw it and feared. The ends of the earth were afraid, drew near and came. They helped every one of his neighbor and every one said to his brother, be of good courage. So the carpenter encouraged the goldsmith and he that smoothed out with the hammer, him that smote the anvil saying, it is ready for the soldering. And he fastened it with nails, that it should not be moved. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of my people. 
whom I, though thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth, and called thee from the chief men thereof, and said unto thee, Thou art my servant, I have chosen thee, and not cast thee out. And, let's see here, okay. So basically, here we have Israel is the chosen servant. Number 42, Isaiah 42. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Okay. And who is that servant? Okay. Once again, election and service. Well, let's look at Matthew 12, 14 through 20. Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and the great multitudes followed him, and he healed them, and charged them that they should not make known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him. And he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. Alright, so basically, the one who is, um, and I'll just skip forward to 21. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Obviously, this is talking about Jesus in Isaiah 42. So Jesus is the elect servant. But if Jesus were chosen or elect to salvation... Then how do we get saved? Jesus, if he was chosen for salvation, would have been a sinner to be saved. But if Jesus was a sinner, then he could not save anyone else. Now, let's see here. One last look at Isaiah 43. Yeah, I know. I'm really losing sword drills today. I apologize. Okay. We'll look at one. Isaiah 43, one. But now... Thus saith the Lord that created, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. So Jacob, very much. Jacob is the flesh name of Israel. Okay, So if it's Jacob in the flesh, then it's the ethnic people. And so he says that, um, he says, I have formed thee. And have called thee by thy name. There's another doctrine, by the way, of calling. Which I think in the Bible is probably kind of like there's two words in the New Testament. Klesis and proskaleo. And klesis might be uh, a synonym of a similar name or similar definition to chosen in election. But I just haven't gone deep enough in my exegesis of that. So I'm not going to claim it right now. You can just check it out yourself. <laughs> but basically that's where that's at. Um, let's see here. 
But what you have to do is you have to go and search the Greek and the Hebrew and search every reference, okay, to understand the context to get the definition. Now, verse 13. Yea, before the day was, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. Is that what I was going for? Well, let's go with uh, 14. Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One Israel, for your sake I have sent to Babylon. I think I should have went through the whole passage, but I don't have a lot of time. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me, and understand that I am he before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after. And uh, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. So that is Isaiah 43, 10 and 11. All right, that was um, my problem because I had chicken scratch. <laughs> All right. Um, now, so we, we've, we've had this again, okay? So when we understand election as it's originally proposed in the scripture, it is service and it identifies, uh, starting at the beginning, it identifies as Israel, ethnic Israel, as the chosen people. Now, um, when we look at the uh, Calvinist doctrine, which really starts with Augustine, Augustine is confusing the Roman Catholic Empire with the church because by his time, uh, Constantine took over and forced the Roman Empire under some sort of Christendom or what we call Christendom, all right? And so basically with those presuppositions, he makes election part of, like he makes the kingdom of God out to be Rome or the Holy Roman Empire. That's where this confusion is happening, okay? But um, basically, the doctrine of election as it's traditionally proposed in theology really just hits this rub and here's another rub acts chapter 10 verses 34 and 35 then peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is without him. So once again we have these of the nations, of these people. When you recognize that as Israel is the who of chosen, then this all makes sense. The Jews and the Gentiles means the whole world. Okay, there's no exception. Either you're a Jew or you're a Gentile. No exception. Everybody's included. Universal. Okay. Um, but basically, the rub is that it says God is no respecter of persons. Unconditional election, as is traditionally proposed, says that God has a greater love for uh, the elect from the foundation of the world. In fact, the elect get Jesus. The unelect, not only do they not ever receive him, but Jesus is never truly offered because of limited atonement. And limited atonement only comes from the traditional doctrine of election. That's the problem. That's what's going on here. Um, if you understand atonement as it's biblically proposed, 
then it has to be general. The extent is universal. Every single way it says that Jesus died for all, all mankind, Savior to all, propitiation for the sins of the whole world, okay? Over and over again, these are all the phrases that you would use to make a universal statement. And we use the same universal statements for the sinful nature. So if the sinful nature is universal, and it is, therefore, the extent of the atonement is universal. And the extent of the atonement tries to get messed with based off a doctrine that can contradicts this. Okay, Acts chapter 10, verse 34 said that God is no respecter of persons. Okay. Now, we go back and we start to look at how things develop. There is going to be a development going from Israel being chosen, okay, for that service, okay, and Israel is always chosen for that service to be this separated people. But now it's going to switch over to another type of chosen, another type of election. But we'll start to observe more passages, how that works itself out. But when it comes to God's people in the New Testament, I think we should observe something uh, from Jesus. It's in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. It says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but onto a candlestick, and give it light unto all that are in the house. Let your light shine so before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And so it says the people of God are the light to the world. Okay, Ye are the light of the world. So if we the people of God are the light of the world, then is the Calvinistic statement, no one knows who the elect are. Is that really biblical? I don't remember any verse that says we don't know who the elect are. Now that's presupposing the Catholic Calvinist doctrine of election. Okay, It's under that presupposition and then they say, well, the people who get saved, nobody knows who's ultimately going to be saved. Who's going to really be in that number? But if that's not the true doctrine of election, then this idea of we don't know who the elect are, never found in the scripture anyway, just man-made doctrine. The elect are supposed to be the light of the world, okay? We're supposed to be transparent. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. It's not that necessarily we have to reach so many people to get saved, but it's simply the fact that that our salvation is something that will exercise its way out of us. When we get the love in us, we'll have love to give out from us. Okay. So, we go back to this transition. Matthew chapter 20. All right, chapter 20, verses 12 through 16. Is right? Yeah. Saying, the, these last have I wrought, but one hour, 
and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden in the heat of the day. This is a parable that Jesus is teaching about how there was a man who hired out workers, okay? And he's hired them for the same price, but they worked different hours. One group worked a whole lot of hours, and one group worked relatively little for the same pay. And he says, um, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered unto them, and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even, at, under, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? That's a good capitalism verse. But basically, the Lord can make a deal with whoever he wants. And he says, Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. For many be called, but few chosen. So, once again, this chosen is in relation to a work of service, okay? Um, we would want to say, oh, yeah, well, many people would call, but few are elect from the foundation of the world. No, that's not, it's not a salvation issue in this passage. It's talking about work. It's a service issue. It says, um... Let's go to 22, verses 10 through 8. So those servants went out unto the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with the guest. And when the king came in to see the guest, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto them, Friend, how comest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And let me make sure I get this right. All right. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they uh, might entangle him in his talk. So basically what this parable is dealing with is the fact that you know, Israel is God's chosen servants, but they turned their backs on him. And so he's decided to uh, not only invite Israel to salvation, but he's invited the Gentiles as well. Okay. But you do have to convert. Okay. So there is a choice of will there. He didn't put on his wedding garments. Then also we see um, Matthew 24, verses 12 through, verses 12 and 31, no, Matthew 24, verses 24 and 31, for there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. These are the chosen servants that they are deceiving. They're not getting Christians to lose their salvation. This is verse 31. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. 
And so there it is, Bible prophecy about Israel, the elect being gathered together. And then this be gathering from the angels. And it's supposed to happen during what we call the Great Tribulation. Biblically, it might be better be called the time of Jacob's trouble. And then, um, let's see here. So now you have this offer to Israel. They don't do it. So then salvation becomes offered to all men. All right. And so there is a switching. Who's going to do the service of God? Well, you still, you know, throughout the Gospels, you still have this election being brought up as the Israel Jewish election. Then, in Romans 8, there's reference, but it's reference to the saints. Let's see if we can find that. All right. Verse 33 of Romans 8. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. And then we skip on down. I mean, it's a great passage, devotional, don't get me wrong. But once again, I'm just trying to save time. So um, skip down to ver verse 37. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We're conquering. Conquering is a form of service from the military to the king. So it's still election unto service. But now it's going to start focusing on those who are saved. And that will be evidence from Romans 9. Which I think I covered in the last... A video dealing with predestination and free will so I'll let that one go and then um, so now we have a switch over and the Apostle Peter is going to do a better job of identifying this now that Paul has referenced it Peter is going to hit this point home in 1st Peter 2 1 Peter 2, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And um, let's see here. Okay, I'll just keep on reading it. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. Once again, Jesus is elect and precious. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, has become the cornerstone. Sorry. Disallowed the same is made the head of the corner. Verse 8. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation. So there we go again. Ye is now chosen. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. Remember the people of God being the light. You could identify them. And it says, which in time past were not a people. Oh, they're not Jews. Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So here we have it identified. Now the chosen has switched from the Jewish race. Scratch that. 
Now the election has switched from the elect Jews to the elect church, okay, or the elect Christians. That would probably be better. Now this is a different service, okay, so we're just switching the emphasis. But the servants of God at this point are now the servants of God, the Christians, who follow Christ. Okay, it's not the servants of God Israel. Now, the servants of God Israel will have their works and service to do, but they will have to become Christians to experience the atonement. And I'm going to um, give a presentation of my theology. I guess I'll go ahead and link that one to this group as well, just to kind of come to the truth. But. How, what kind of service is the uh, is this church? Is this Christianity? Okay. So we look over into Acts one eight. It might go a little bit earlier too. Probably be better that way. And it says in uh, verse 6, When they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? Remember the chosen elect. So we'll restore again the kingdom of Israel. And he said unto you, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father shall put in his own power. Okay. Verse 8, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And the power of God. Dynamite! It's Greek. Anyway. Um, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be my witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And so the work of the church, the service, is witnessing. Okay. Now, let me go backwards and forwards and backwards. All right. Matthew, let's see here. Oh, yeah. Revelation 22, verse 11. So we'll go forwards and backwards. All right. And... All right, it says, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him athirst come, and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely. So there's that offering. And what is this offering going to? It's, it's coming from the Bride, which is the gathered church. Okay, so it's still offering it out. So there it is. The church is bringing that offer to people. Okay, it's going to be soul winning. Matthew 4. Or, well, let me do more. Well, yeah, I'll do Matthew. It's also in Mark. Oh. 
And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, say two saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Once again, that was the original call of Jesus. This is actually what I would argue is forming the original Christian church. Well, it'll be the original church of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is calling them out. All right. Mark chapter 1, verse 15, in saying, this is Jesus, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. That's the good news. Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brothers, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. So following, they would become fishers of men. Soul winners. Okay. Um, there is a group uh, within uh, Reformed uh, circles right now telling people, don't ask Jesus in your heart. Um, the, the idea is that I go, okay, well, the Bible does say things about asking, okay, and, um, I can probably find this quick enough, in Luke 11, Okay, in Luke 11, I'll start at um, verse uh, 9. Ask, I'm sorry, and I say unto you, this is Jesus, ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. And if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he uh, for a fish give him a serpent? Or uh, shall he ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Okay, so there it is. The Bible says ask, all right? Remember, they're saying don't ask Jesus in your heart. Now, if you ask, it talks about the Holy Spirit, but also the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ flowing from Christ, okay? And the Spirit of Christ, therefore, Christ dwells in your heart. And we can see this in Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all of the fullness of God. All right, so there is ask, there is Jesus in your heart. One more. 
Revelation chapter 3. He's talking to the Church of Laodicea. Church of Laodicea is apostate. And so here's what he says to them in verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh, I will grant even to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sit down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith in the churches. Now they'll say this is a church, this is believers. No. This is an apostate church. This is a church in disobedience. And because of its disobedience, some of its members do not have Jesus in their heart. That's why he's offering it. Okay. I, that's Jesus, stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open up the door, I will come into him and will sup with him. And he with me. And so... This is a natural part of the Great Commission, okay? Telling people to seek, knock, ask. Jesus is coming into their heart. Ask Jesus in your heart. They're saying, don't ask Jesus in your heart. Traditionally, a lot of Calvinists will say, think like a Calvinist, witness like an Arminian, okay? But, because of this extreme... Now they're saying, don't ask Jesus in your heart. Ha, ha, ha. And they try to act like it's unbiblical because the phrase is not there, even though every part of the phrase is biblical. And this is part of where the rub is between election and atonement. If election is according to the Augustinian Calvinist theology. But once you understand the biblical theology... Then you understand that we are chosen to be soul winners, to be fishers of men. Okay? And what does that look like? Last passage, 2 Corinthians. Chapter 6. Oh, flipping that last page. All right. When then, as workers together with him, okay, this is Paul, Second Corinthians chapter seven, Second Corinthians chapter six. We then, as workers together with him, our work. Beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation, giving no offense in anything. That the ministry be not blamed. But in all things approved ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in, inflict, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost. By love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. By honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true and unknown and yet well known as dying. And behold, we live as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. O oh, ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. My friends, God has chosen us to reach the lost.